Good morning. The Town of Southern Shores Council Workshop for February the 18th, 2020 is now in session. Quick reminder to sign up for the public hearing comment or public comment uh, if you haven't done so. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Council, I need a motion to approve this morning's agenda. Thank you, Leo. Do I have a second? Thank you. Matt. All in favor of approving the agenda, indicate by saying aye. 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 We now have an agenda. Uh, at this time, I would open general public comment. And we have two speakers signed up. Ann Schwarzma. Good morning, Ann. Good Good morning, everyone. Ann Scherzma, 69 Hickory Trail. I'd like to speak to the pay plan study. Um, first, I'd like to say that I don't begrudge anyone generous compensation for hard work and a job well done. Um, but I also have issues with flawed studies and meaningless statistics and other problems of methodology, which I identify in this particular study. I think the biggest omission in the study is that we don't have hard data about how many employees are employed by the town. There, I believe it's about 30, and some of them are part-time, not all are full-time. It would have been very helpful to have seen a list of all the positions that are now filled and how long those people have been in their positions and what their salary is, just the numbers. Um, the, the bell curves that are in the study have no meaning whatsoever because you don't use a bell curve with a non-random population, like a 30-person workforce, or with some of these other um, population samples. You only use it for normal distribution with a random sample and a large enough one, too. Um, I, I think, too, that the averages that are mentioned are rather meaningless. The overall average of 62000 something for a salary, where well, you take 30 people, that's apples and oranges. You got a high-end town manager's salary. You have a lower-end um, administrative assistant. You have some police officers that, may, officers that maybe if you would compare them as a whole, however many there are, 15 or so, you could have come up with a legitimate, defensible average. But when you take all these other disparate um, positions, you really can't come up with a legitimate average. Um, as you can tell, when you look at the average out of the administration, department, um, it's about $85,000. Well, that's because you have a town manager up here, and then you have three other people below that town manager. Um, another omission with the study is the benefits. Um, this is salary. You're looking at pay grades. But benefits at, in Southern Shores are very generous. And if you average them in, um, you'll see that we're way ahead of most of the comparable markets. Um, FYI, and I'm running out of time, um, Southern Shores currently puts 28% of the budget into salaries. If you include benefits, you're up to 39%. And that's a differentiation that we should, you should recognize because our revenue is substantially less than all these so-called comparable markets. We have a revenue of $6.2 million. The closest comparable market to my name, to my um, understanding is Duck which has revenue of about $11 million. Kitty Hawk, $9.7 million. Kitty Hawk, Kill Devil Hills and Nag said you're up at 20%. I mean, 20 million, excuse me. Um, I ran out of time, but Duck has its pay salary grades online for you to compare. Thank you, Ann. 
Joe Van Giesen. <clears throat> Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Mayor. Uh, Joe Van Giesen, 228 North Dogwood. I echo the sentiments of uh, Mr. Churchma regarding the statistics. They're not, even though they may not be appropriate uh, in terms of you know, technical approach, they're, they're irrelevant. It, the empirical comparison to other towns in the area is, or region is much more appropriate. A couple of things about that. A few months ago, I sent to the town council an analysis that I did. I took the budgets, the 2018 budgets from all the towns in the beach uh, from, from Manio North and calculated the administrative staff salary and benefits costs from their budgets as a percentage of the overall town budget, excluding police and fire. So just the administrative staff versus overall. And Southern Shore is far and away, except for one, one town, and I forget which one it is, pays the highest percentage of our overall costs for our administrative staff than anybody else. One is close, but the others are far, far below us. So just, just for context, we're, we're paying a lot relative to our overall budget um, compared to the other towns. The other thing is, uh, it's interesting that the study breaks out police salaries and compares them with the rest of the, uh, the regional uh, towns or municipalities. And it, it breaks and it takes the total uh, average salaries and compares them. But it doesn't compare administrative staff costs or salaries. And I think that's a tremendous omission. Uh, that's a big, big part of our, our uh, staff costs, and I think that it should be amended and that should be included. Uh, I don't know that this was an appropriate topic for this study. I don't know what the uh, instructions were given or if there's a standard format for it or not, but there one word does not show up in this pay, pay study anywhere, and that is performance. And our staff are guaranteed a specific percentage salary increase every year, no matter what. All they have to do is be there. And there's no, no discussion of performance anywhere in this report, and I've never heard a discussion of performance in any of the budget uh, meetings that we've ever had. And I think we should be giving our, our staff some incentives, some objective criteria for performance standards, and, and, a, and a performance review every year, and salary increases should be based on performance, not just for showing up. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> This time I'd like to welcome Sir David Hill um, from the Piedmont Triangle Regional Council to present their recent paid uh, plan and, and classification study for the town to consider. Mr. Hill. Welcome to Southern Shores, by the way. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I do appreciate the comments. Uh, that preceded my appearance here. And actually in the presentation, I will address some of those comments that, uh, that were brought up. Uh, but to begin with, and I do have to establish some parameters in a study that I do. And I do use a bell curve. I do use standard deviation as the backdrop of the data that I'm looking at, the data that I'm uh, analyzing. The first group of uh, data that we're going to look at is what Southern Shores looked like at the beginning of the study. So this data is gleaned from a report that I received from the town on July 2nd. So all of the data that we're going to take a look at at the beginning of this presentation is the workforce data as of July 2nd. But beginning with the bell curve, and I do I don't use standard deviation. I don't I don't use any of that empirical data specific to the bell curve. The bell curve, in my use for these studies, is to to establish a backdrop, and I do measure that against several different. 
components of the, of the data. One of those components, and we'll look at that in some of the slides, is uh, how long employees have been working for you, how long they've been working in the, their current position. The bell curve, as probably most of you know, can be that backdrop to measure any data that can be measured in a workforce. Now, that certainly can be used for employee performance where you would have brand new employees or poor performing employees on the far left side of that bell curve, very high performing employees on the very right side of the curve, and of course there's where the smaller numbers are located. Most of your employees, depending on the methodology that you use for performance evaluation, if they were performing the job exactly the way that you expected them to perform, they would appear somewhere in that middle one-third. And that's where you would expect to find most of your employees. Now, that data, that bell curve, that methodology can be used to, to measure height and weight and eye color and anything else that you wanted to measure. So the, the whole purpose of that is to just to establish a, the backdrop. Because what I'm looking for is where does the workforce fit within that thirds of that bell curve? And my process, I look at establishing a mature workforce as somebody who's been working in their current position between eight and 10 years, minimum. And I would expect to find about two thirds of your workforce in the middle one third of that bell curve. That bell curve also represents a salary grade range. The minimum of the range or the hiring rate would be on that far left side. The maximum of the rate would be on the far right side. The midpoint of a salary range, which should be the equivalent of the market value of a position, is located in the very center. Now, those numbers that you see down at the bottom, I use compa ratio as uh, another measurement. And if an employee is exactly in the middle, if an employee's salary is exactly at the midpoint of their salary range, they would have a compa ratio of 1.00. Any number less than that, the salary is going to be less than the midpoint. Obviously, a number greater than that, their salary is going to be greater than the midpoint, or technically greater than the value of the position. So I use that only as a backdrop to, to create, for me, that visual of what does that workforce look like. Now. I have a technical inability to recreate a bell curve. My bell curves, as you will see in the grass, look more like a St. Louis arch. I apologize for that. I just do not have that technical ability to recreate a bell curve on these charts. But when I look at how long your employees have been with you, that's a typical distribution. You've got a little more than a third of your employees been with you less than five years. More than half have been with you less than 10 years. The average length of employment is 8.2 years. So you're just barely in, you just barely crossed over that threshold of what I assume to be that mature workforce, eight to 10 years. So your average length of employment is 8.2 years. Your longest serving employee has been with you 21 years. I next look at how long each employee has been in their current position. And you can see there the, the bars start leaning more to the left side. And that's mostly because of promotions, because this measures how long employees have been in their current position. So I may have started work here several years ago as a police officer one, but I've been promoted to police officer two or perhaps sergeant. So this measures how long I've been in my current position. The chart before this measures how long I've actually been working for the town. So you've got greater than half of your employees have been in their current position less than five years, over 80% less than 10 years, average length of service in their current position 5.4 years. This, this, this will measure several different things. This chart, I'm taking a look at each of your current pay grades, the classifications assigned to each of those pay grades, 
and where individual salaries are in relation to their position, their specific pay grade. The black bar in the center is the midpoint of your salary range. You currently have a salary range of 50%, which means your maximum salary is 50% greater than your minimum. So the midpoint or that highest point of the bell curve is that black bar. You can see that you've got greater than 30% of your employees whose salaries are less than 5% above the minimum. You have that same 38% employees whose salaries are less than 10% above minimum. And you can see in that highest bar, to the right of that highest bar, you have no employees whose salaries fall within that next 2, 4, 6%. Each, each bar represents a 2% range. So the same 38.1% of employees whose salaries are less than 5% also make up the same group whose salaries are less than 10% above minimum. So again, I look at this from, from the greater overall, how, 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 do, how are you measured against yourself? This is, this is not comparing you to any other local government. This is not comparing you to the overall market. This is just taking a snapshot of you and comparing yourself to yourself. Now, I'm going to talk now about what is the market? Who should you be compared to? Now, initially, I gathered data all the way from Chesapeake, Virginia to Wilmington, North Carolina. So I gathered data on, for the most part, the, the, the coastal region. And this measures the average salary of every full-time permanent position within each one of those local governments. Now obviously you see that there are several county governments up there. County governments have departments of health, of social services, registers as deeds, boards of election. County governments have a lot of classifications that are not relevant to your study, but are included in this particular graph because this graph is just gathering all of the data to see how each individual local government compares to each, other, each of the other local governments. And that average of all of those is 50,237. And if you look where Southern Shores is located, the gold bar on the far right side, your average salary for each of your regular full-time employees, and again, it's regular full-time employees. None of this data includes data for part-time employees. But you can see that your average salary is 62, 622, almost 25% greater than that overall average of all the other governments. Again, this is just initial data that I'm collecting. It is not going to be actually part of recommendations that I make. This is creating this view of this coastal region. How do you compare? What I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides is specific data for sp specific classifications. I'm going to show you police officer. Not to take up more time than I'm going to take up. I'm not going to show you all of this. I'm going to show you the data and how I use the data for police officer. This is the same methodology that I use for every one of your classifications. Every one of your classifications has a worksheet that looks just like that. So when I compare each of your classification, whether that was for manager, whether that was for clerk, whether that was for police officer, police chief, Every one of your classifications has this kind of worksheet, which then breaks down all of that overall data down to comparison or comparing apples to apples. This is comparing police officer one to everybody else's police officer one. This is not comparing police your police officer one to somebody else's police officer two or sergeant or any other classification. This is as true an apples to apples as you can get in these kinds of studies. 
knowing that, even in a police officer, even in a clerk, a manager, there is not a 100% match anywhere in the state of North Carolina. A police officer here does greater than 85% of the very same things that a police officer somewhere else in Murphy or Asheville or Winston-Salem or Duck or wherever it may be. There's always going to be that 10 to 15% of duties, responsibilities, and authorities that are unique to that location. So in these comparisons, if I can get about an 85% comparison, that's about as close as you can get. That's as probably the closest to a, a, an apples to apples as you can get. But what this does is measure what is the minimum salary? What is that entry level salary for a police officer? It also gives us the midpoint and the maximum. It also gives us the average salary. And again, this is data collected back in July. This provides the average salary for each of those local governments, their police officer one classification, or in the case of those county governments, deputy. Compa ratio is that column that measures, back to that bell curve slide, that compa ratio measures where their average salary is compared to the midpoint of their salary ranges. Compa ratio is something that I focus on a lot because when I get to my recommendations, my recommendation is to move your employees to a market-based salary grade and then for those employees who move to that grade, place their salary at the same compa ratio or at that same relative position in that new grade as they currently hold in their current grade. And we'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. But comparing police officer one to that larger market, that coastal market, you can see it at the entry level. Your, your entry level is almost 12% greater than the average of all those other local governments. You can also see that your average actual salary for your police officer won, and at that time there were three employees in that classification. The average salary for those three employees back on July 2nd was 44084 which is seven, a little greater than 7% greater than the average of everybody else. So this, this is part of that beginning of the salary, the larger market. I began then to start paring down, reducing, refining. Where is that actual market? Where is that actual competitive market that you should be compared to? Well, it's not necessarily from Chesapeake to Wilmington. Perhaps it's Duck to Manio. So when you take a look at that refined group, that refined market, those comparisons, you can see that now at that entry level salary, you're still a little higher than the average of everybody else, but that, that difference has been reduced to less than 5%. And then when you take a look at the actual average salary, you can see that you went from being 7% above the average on that larger market comparison to now, police officer one actually is greater than 3% below the average. Down at the bottom, you can see where I've, your current grade for police officer one is grade 14. If I just use that data to determine what pay grade police officer one should be in, based on that data, it probably needs to be in grade 13, maybe not 14. The overall average is 41,129. If we move that to grade 13, that would put you at 41,211. Be almost right, even with. My recommendation, however, is to keep police officer one in grade 14, because if we just use those, uh, that smaller number of local governments as that comparison, and if history is repeated, if the, if the history for the past four, five, even six years is used, the average salary and the average data for these, or this particular group of local governments is probably on average going to increase 2% on or shortly after this next coming July 1st. So in the next fiscal year, 
that data that you're comparing yourself against right there is probably going to be increased about 2%. So if we increase 41.129 by 2%, that's still going to be a little below the current grade 14 data. But I think that's where you need to be. That'll, put, that'll place you just barely above what the new average is going to be. Again, assuming that all of that data is going to be increased 2% on or after July 1st. My recommendation is that police officer one remain in grade 14. Now you can see that grade 14 data is a little different down at the bottom than your current grade 14, which is up in the middle. Your current minimum is 43,166. The new minimum is going to be 43,272. That's because I took your current grades, your current ranges, the current salaries that make up those ranges and smooth them all out. Over the years, you, you, you typically uh, were at a 5% differential from one grade to the next and a, a pretty standard 50% range from minimum to maximum. But over the years, when you update salary data uh, in spreadsheets especially, it depends on how the data is rounded up or rounded down. So your current pay plan does not have a specific 5% differential nor a, a very specific 50% range. 50.01, 49.9 in the range. The, the differential uh, is not 5%, 4.9, 4 4.8, 5.01. So when you look at the grade 14 down at the bottom of that page, that data is mm, $100 higher than it is up there at the top. That came about because I just went in and just standardized the ranges and the differentials. Again, the data that I'm showing you is for police officer one. This is the same methodology that I went through for each of your classifications. Each of your classifications has worksheets just like this. And again, not to take up a half a day going through each of those classifications, I'm showing you the data for police officer one and just letting you know that each of your classifications has the same worksheet, has the same data methodology that I work through. So now let's talk a little bit about the, the process itself. Uh, I came on site uh, back in the summer. I met in this room with groups of employees. I went over the study. I discussed the study with them. I told them what the study was. I also mentioned to them what the study was not. Because in that presentation and in all of this process, greater than 85% of my time is spent on the classification, on the position. It's only at that last 5, 10, maybe 15% of my time do I start looking at individual salaries. The purpose of, the, the primary purpose of a, a pay study is not the individual employee, it's the classification. What is the proper classification for police officer one? Where is that market position that you need to have to be competitive? When you advertise for police officer one, where is that advertised salary in comparison to Duck to Manio? So greater than 85% of my time is spent on the classification, on the positions. So each employee then completed a 12-page position description questionnaire. That was 12 pages of employees telling me exactly what they did in their position. That 12 pages captures from them every element of their position, what they do, how they do it, what do they do it with, how often do they do it, and if they're involved in a process, who do they do something to and provide something to somebody else, or who's doing something that gets provided to them. This captures, and this is that information, this and, and uh, job descriptions, you can see that I also came back on site several weeks after that and met individually with every employee to talk to them more about their position. All of this was 
to assist us in making sure that we, we were comparing your positions as best we could to similar positions in other local governments. So I came back on site, met with those employees. All the time we began collecting the data, analyzing the data. From that I developed some preliminary uh, recommendations, came back on site, met with, with Wes and Bonnie. We went over those preliminary numbers, those recommendations. Uh, I then prepared the report that I think each of you have and they are obviously here today. Now, just looking back, this is, this is that group of local governments that I began the study with. Now, you can see that there are three in that bottom right corner that we tried to include in the study, did not receive any data, even though the data is public information and they're required to provide that information to us. After three attempts, it, it's no longer time efficient to keep trying to get data from somebody that's not willing to give it to you. We did use some Elizabeth City data, but it was data that we collected from their website. It was not data that they willingly provided to us. All the other local governments willingly provided data to us. But again, that was that larger market to create or establish or define what this coastal geographic average salary is for each of the classifications. Now obviously there's more detailed information in, in the report, but the very first one is the development of a, it could be called a salary and a benefits philosophy statement. It's very similar to a mission or vision statement. A local government may have a vision or a mission statement that defines who they wish to be, how they wish to deliver services. This statement is that missing part of that mission and vision statement in that in a vision or mission statement you may be, and I'm just making this up, you wish to be the greatest deliverer of services of any local government in the state of North Carolina. This particular statement is the development of that uh, vision of how do you administer, pay, benefits, performance, those employees who then carry out that mission and vision statement that you've created. You want to be the greatest deliverer of services. Well, it's the employees that make, make it possible for you to be that, to do that. In your report is a sample of what that statement, that philosophy statement could look like. I would also recommend that you do a comprehensive study uh, every three to five years. Because especially in emergency services, and that includes law enforcement, fire, in counties, EMS, paramedics, there are certain classifications that you do not need to wait another three, four, five, or longer years to take a look at. Especially with law enforcement, fire, again, the emergency services kinds of positions. Those kinds of positions are in a volatile period right now. There are fewer and fewer people who wish to become police officers. The market or the demand for that smaller supply becomes greater. So there are certain classifications that you probably need to be mindful of what's the market for th these particular classifications. And those, you, again, you don't need to wait three, four, five years to do that. That may be something that you want to do annually or every other year. Or just keep a close look on or a look at those kinds of positions. And then certainly the reclassification, if you do have a position 
that has undergone some dramatic permanent change in duties, responsibilities, and authorities, that falls under the reclassification where you, where you just take a look at that classification and based on these newly assigned duties, responsibilities, and authorities, that position alone gets reclassified perhaps to a higher or different pay grade. And you can do those without a complete revision of your pay plan. And again, to remain market competitive, the whole focus of your administration needs to be on two components. Th that, that minimum or that entry level, you need to remain as market competitive as you can when you advertise for police officer or any other position. You need to at least be market competitive to get the kinds of candidates applying for your position, the kinds of candidates that you would hope would apply for positions here. And that you're not directly, if, if you advertise for police officer one and your advertised range is not competitive, and I'm that candidate looking to apply at Duck or Manio or any other place in between, are they going to get my application and you're not? Or are you going to get my application and they're not? So the focus, and back to the bell curve, uh, that midpoint of the salary range should represent the market value. And that doesn't necessarily have to be exactly there, plus or minus 3%, plus or minus 5%. That, that, that's, that's a local decision to define where you want to be. Another thing, and this represented in, in some of those graphs that we looked at, where are employee salaries compared to their range? But when we looked at that other bar graph, and we see that on average, Southern Shores salaries are greater than everybody else, you were that gold bar sitting way over here on the far right side. Your salaries are 25% greater than everybody else. But when you look at where position, where, where employee salaries are in their current grade, they were not all way over here at the max. They, they, the greatest number were down here at that 5% above minimum. When you do cost of livings or any other kind of salary adjustment, by looking at police officer one, you could see that your current range is a little higher than everybody else. So now at this point, I'm going to make this up again. Let's say that on or after July 1st, the town implements a 2% cost of living. Don't take your salary ranges and increase them 2%. Your salary ranges are already competitive. Pick your employees up and move them 2%. That then begins, begins to create some separation between, and I haven't talked about salary compression yet, but if we went back to that one slide, that highest bar on that graph where employee salaries are compared to their minimum, that highest number was employees whose salaries are 5%. Those are employees who came to work for you at minimum and received a 5% salary adjustment at the completion of their probation period. They're still sitting there. That was that highest bar on that one particular chart. So moving employees without moving the range is beneficial to you because you don't necessarily have to move your ranges because you are a little above average right now. Move your employees, start moving them across the range. Start creating that separation of your current employees from brand new employees who will then come to work for you. Back to police officer one. Move, move your current employees, and again, I'm back to this made up 2% cost of living. Move your employees 2%. Brand new employee who comes to work as a police officer one on or after July 1st comes to work at the new minimum. Your current employees have at least moved 2% more away from the minimum. Now, I'm also going to talk about in the next slide, 
where you have employees, where there are two or more employees in the same classification, their salary needs to be at least 5% above minimum because you have two very specific classifications, police officer one and your public works uh, maintenance technician. You, you have two or more employees in those classifications. If you don't take your current employees and move their salary at least 5% above minimum, that means on or after July 1st, a brand new police officer or a brand new public works technician comes to work at the, new, at the minimum. At the completion of their probationary period, they're going to get a 5% salary adjustment, which could have the effect of leapfrogging those brand new employees over current employees. So I think in the next slide, one of my other recommendations is for those particular classifications, make sure that those employees' salaries are at least 5% above minimum. Now, the next bullet on this particular slide begins to get into methodologies of moving employees across, horizontally across. Uh, that philosophy statement incorporates a lot of these. It also incorporates employee performance, that there needs to be that direct correlation between employee performance and salary advancement, but it also can include a career development uh, ladder. I apologize for using police officer as, as examples here, but police officers or law enforcement officers have to have that basic certification level to even be in that line of work, but they also have an opportunity based on time education, several different components to get an intermediate certification. They then also can obtain a advanced certification. There's value attached to an officer who has an intermediate or an advanced certification. Part of this is developing these career development policies, procedures that actually assigns a value what is it worth that one of your officers obtains or rises to that level that they're now qualified to have that intermediate certification or the advanced certification? So that, that's part of that, that consideration. I think that as part of the overall salary administration, back to that philosophy statement, what are all of those parts that make up who Southern Shores wants to be as an employer. Right now in your salary ranges, you have a hiring rate, which then goes to a minimum, midpoint, and maximum. There are very few local governments now that have this hiring rate. That was a technique from uh, more years ago than I am old where you could bring somebody in less than 5% below market, below what the actual average minimum salary was, and once they completed their probation period, then they got moved to the real minimum. Again, grade 14, that's that, that grade that police officer one is in. Your competitive, your hiring rate is competitive to everybody else's minimum salary. So let's just eliminate this higher rate, just have a, a pay plan that has a minimum, a midpoint, and a maximum, your range is still going to be 50%, and your, your new minimum for grade 14 is <coughs> going to be almost the exact average of all those other local governments. All right, so then when I, I looked at all of those classifications, all of that market data, where should each of your classifications be assigned? There was one classification that my recommendation is to move it three grades below where it currently is. There's one classification that my current recommendation is that it moves five grades higher than it currently is. But you can see that you have nine classifications that are right where they need to be. And then there are three classifications that need to go up one grade, two classifications that need to go up two grades. And that's based on that comparative analysis that you saw in those, those two 
charge that had the police officer one data on it. Comparing apples to apples, here's where my current recommendation is that your classifications be. So the actual implementation, uh, let's take my recommendations based on that comparative analysis that I use. Assign each of your classifications to that market-based grade. And then move every employee to their new grade and place them at that same comp ratio, place them at that same relative position in the new grade as they hold in the current grade. So if, if I'm uh, not using comp ratio but using uh, percentages, if my current salary is 20% above minimum and I, my position gets moved to a new position, my salary then gets placed at that same percentage above that minimum as it is above the current minimum. And here is where, again, in the report, if there are two or more employees in the same classification, their salaries need to at least be 5% greater than the minimum to prevent a brand new employee coming to work on or after July 1st. And once they get their 5% into probation increase, their salary automatically moves to that 5% above. So, I actually took a look at some recommendations that would move employees further up the scale, but I think this is, is a first step. Place them at least 5% so that no new employee comes to work and then ends up earning more than they are earning. So through all of that process, The increase in salaries uh, is going to be a little over 58000 And then to that, approximately 21% that's going to factor in FICA retirement, 401k, all of those direct salary-related additional costs. So the total cost of those recommendations is going to be about 70400 Now, also as part of your study, uh, based on all the data that employees gave me in that 12-page questionnaire, data I got from employees during the uh, interview process, I took all of your job descriptions and based on all of that current data. And I updated it based on all that data, sent it back, each of your department directors looked at that. Uh, from there, we made some uh, modifications, some fine-tuning of some language, but you now have job descriptions that are current as of the data provided during this study. So that was uh, a quick overview of the methodology. The data that I look at, how I use that data, the recommendations that I make as a result of that process. So I look forward to answering any question that you may have. Gotcha. Any questions for our presenter? Explain a little bit about that. I see some, some were classified exempt. How did how, how did you arrive at that, that that classification? Under the Fair Labor Standards Act, there are some some clearly <coughs> defined uh, da uh, duties, responsibilities, and authorities that a position has to have to be exempt. Or if they don't have those, the position is non-exempt. And then, of course, the difference in exempt and non-exempt is a non-exempt employee 
work, a defined work schedule, and if they work more than 40 hours in a week, they're eligible for overtime. Except law enforcement, that yeah. falls under a special paragraph yeah. under IRS rules, uh, 207K schedule, where they can get paid uh, for, typically it's 171 hours in a 28-day time period, or 84 hours in a 14-day time period before they're eligible for overtime. That also applies to firefighters. But only law enforcement and firefighters are administered under that particular schedule. But those are, those are for the non-exempt employees. So typically a non-exempt employee gets paid overtime if they work more than 40 or compensated. Uh, because you do have the opportunity to compensate employees with comp time rather than actual dollars paid. An exempt, uh, an exempt employee, as you know, is uh, an employee that meets or exceeds that threshold of duties, responsibilities, and authorities. They get paid a salary without regard to the number of hours they work. Now, a local government can choose to compensate exempt employees if they wish, uh, and that's a local decision. You have no individual decision regarding non-exempt employees you have to compensate them if they work overtime. You don't have to compensate exempt employees. You can, though, if you wish to. So an exempt employee earns a salary without regard to the number of hours. They're required to work the number of hours needed to perform the job that they're in, of course. And typically, that's going to be a, a, a minimum standard of 40 hours. But in that chart that you're looking at, that's my recommended pay plan. That's the recommended pay plan that uh, I provide to you for consideration to be your new pay plan on or after July 1st, the new fiscal year. And that places each of your classifications in the pay grade that I'm recommending based on that methodology that I used. And as part of that, sheet, I show the minimum, the midpoint, the max, and then each of the classifications that are assigned to each of those pay grades. And then I also show which of those classifications should be exempt or non-exempt. Okay. In, in your study, did you move anybody from exempt to non-exempt? No, sir. No, sir. That's all I got. I missed your last question, Leo. Did, did he move anybody from exempt to non-exempt? during his study in, in preparing this chart. Got it. Thank you. And, and his answer was he didn't. Right. Yes, I don't know if this is a question or a comment, but I'm kind of, um, when you compare the salary studies for other municipalities, they're similar. When you go include places like Curry Tuck, New Hanover County, Washington, which I'm assuming is Little Washington here. The huge difference between those comparative salaries is the cost of living in those areas. Yes. Especially yes. housing. I mean, it's not just the housing here in Southern Shores, but even all around us within drivable distance for a police officer or employee. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I'm just kind of skeptical at that chart, that data, that part of the data right there. And, and, and you should be. But that's that initial collection of data. Yes. As I work through and refine that data, my recommendations ended up for the most part being duck to manual. Right. Uh, I, I, I did not include. Wilmington, or New Hanover County, or Washington, or New Bern, or Chesapeake. I did in the initial collection of data, because that's, that's the very first thing I do for any study. I gather a larger geographic area of data, just, just so I can see what this coastal area looks like. Or if I'm working in the western end of the state, what, what the mountain governments look right. like. And then from there is where I then start carrying down or refining the comparisons 
who really is the market? Washington, Wilmington, they're, they're not your market. Duck is, Manio is. So that, that's where my recommendations, for the most part, ended up being that, that smaller group of local governments. Okay. Go ahead. I have a question. I was just wondering if you had a summary <laughs> of the grade changes um, that are represented in this table. Do departments have, to have it, or is it something? That Yes, I, I provided Wes a spreadsheet that has every employee on it, their current classification, current pay grade, recommended classification and pay grade. Yeah. Is it, is it um, rather than individual names and whatnot, more just the, what pay grades you're adjusting and what classification that, is shifting to different grades? That spreadsheet contains individual employee okay. names. And because I, I was trying to arrive at where the seventy thousand dollar increase is, and, and I, I'm guessing as you're taking people to different grades or they're staying the same grade, part of it is since they're on the minimum side of the pay scale, it's yeah. that five percent increase. Yeah. Is, is that a fair assessment? Or? That's cr that's oh. a correct statement. Right. But we have that information. And we'll go through it with the budget when we talk to department heads and stuff like that. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. I haven't done budget yet. So. <laughs> I was just going to ask you if you had done, if your firm had done pay studies for any other community here in Dare County before this one. Uh, three years ago, I completed a study for Nags Head. Okay. Um, two years ago, Washington. I met yesterday afternoon with uh, the manager in Manio to begin doing some work for them. I've done studies for Newburn, uh, Carolina Beach. Uh, uh, I, I can give you. No, I just that's that's great. No, I just was curious. And then, so on the Nags Head study, you said it was about three years ago. Yes. Do you happen to know if they implemented your they did. recommendations? Okay. They did. Okay. And one last question: Do you happen to know, and maybe? Bonnie can answer if you can't. When the last pay study was done for the town of Southern Shores? 2013. 2013. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Almost seven years ago. I got another question. Yes, sir. That, that proposed pay plan chart that you have here, is it possible to have a chart that would show our current play plan so you could look at it? and see what this is doing? Did I miss something? Um, yes, sir. I, I can send that to the council so that you can have that to compare where, yeah, that, our, current, where our current pace um, classification yeah. is, and so that way you can kind of compare it. But I think um, in what Wes has also, it'll show, you know, going from, you know, grade, 13 to 15 or whatever like that, but at least it'll give you where the salaries are and what he's recommended against what we have now. I'd just like to see the, you know, I sure. take it and then look over here and see what, what sure. has changed. Yes, sir. I can send that to the council. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And it may be, Sheila, is it on the um, website? I know at one time the pay, the pay scale. It, I, I can send that at pay regardless. Scale. The pay scale should be on the website. I don't know. I have not looked yeah, to see. I, I just wanted to see, okay, you know, we've got grade 10 and 13. We've got the FLS classification. Mm -hmm. and yep. Yes, sir. I we, have that. Where we I are currently. That. Sure. I can send that to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Any of us have questions for Mr. Hill? Nope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. your time this morning. Thank you. I'm going to give a five-minute break or so right now before we change to our next topic. So anybody who 